I speak the name of Jesus over you In your hurting, in your sorrow I will ask my God to move I speak the name cause it's all that I can do In desperation I'll seek heaven And pray this for you I pray for your healing the circumstances would change I pray that the fear inside would flee In Jesus' name I pray that a breakthrough Would happen today I pray miracles over your life In Jesus' name In Jesus' name Desperation, hard times, and conversations. No one should ever love me like you do. Sometimes my bad decisions define my false suspicions. No one should ever love me like you do.
shaking my own my past was saying no one should ever love me like you do
you gotta welcome the wonder Wait for the answer Worship with your hands in the air I'll praise you anywhere Praise, give it praise, give it praise call to worship with me. We enter with praise and awe because the God of all has drawn us together. In our worship, we draw near to God and in fellowship to one another because the many members of the one body have shown that love is a more excellent way of life. How wonderful it is to be in worship one more time. God deserves our worship and our praise this morning, so let's continue to sing to him. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty? And so much stronger, the King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross
the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain.
emotion suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry then from north to south and east to west we'd hear Christ be magnified were the whole earth echoing his imminence his name would burst from sea and sky
that we have a chance today to, to bring people together in your name. Help the praise of your name to always be on our lips and that we bring worship to you today filled with joy in our hearts. Lord, bless the words that we sing and the words that we hear today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, welcome to Crossview Covenant Church. My name is Brad, one of the pastors here. And this is the Umhoffers. Everybody say hi, Umhoffers. And guys, scoot in. Come on. Come bring a little closer. This is Danny and Ashley, and they're bringing Casey for baptism today. And our tradition, the covenant tradition, comes out of Swedish Lutheran roots. And early on, one of the things they decided is we're not going to fight and argue over the mode a baptism, whether it's believer's baptism or infant baptism. So we teach both and let the families decide. So Casey is going to be baptized this morning. So today, Danny and Ashley bring their, their son to the church for the sacrament of holy baptism. And we rejoice in God's promises as they take this significant step of faith. So let's hear baptism's promise and call. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. And so infant baptism is simply this. It's God choosing to love Casey before Casey can even choose to love God back. back. It's a sacrament. There's grace that is happening in this moment. So I'm going to ask you guys some questions, and then we'll cl close by asking the congregation a question. So do you desire that Casey be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit? Do you? Relying on God's grace, do you promise to teach the word of God to Casey, to pray for him in every way, that he may become a true disciple of Jesus Christ, do you? And then finally, empowered by the Holy Spirit, do you promise to enable Casey to participate fully in the life of the local body of Christ, to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with our God, do you? And then you, the congregation, and the Godparents, do you promise to be faithful to your calling as members of the body of Christ, to set for an example so that Casey and all other children among us may grow up in the knowledge and love of God. If so, please say, we will. Amen. Well, Casey has an older sister named Ava who got baptized a few years ago. Can I take Casey? Yeah. Casey is a pretty chill guy, right? He loves wa watching Ava play around, and he loves watching their dog, Addie. Is that correct? Sounds like a scary dog. <laughs> A little shit too, okay. Um, so Casey's a pretty chill guy, and he is made in the image of God. And so we get to dedicate him to God. So why don't you guys scoot in here. Casey, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. If you could hold a hand out towards Casey. God, we pray over Casey. Lord, you have made him in your image, and we pray that he would grow up to love and follow you. God, we pray over this family. Your blessing, God, that they would choose you as their forgiver and king and that Casey would grow up knowing that there is a God that loves him. So we give him to you. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, amen. Perfect. Would you please stand? And we're going to sing over this family the most important words. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves you, yes, Jesus loves you. Yes, Jesus loves you, the Bible tells me so. Amen and amen. Well, the kids can go to their programming now, and would you turn around and say hi to somebody around you?
Great time in your programming. Hope you can go learn something about Jesus. My name is Libby. I am also one of the pastors here at Crossview. Welcome. We're so glad you're here, especially if you are visiting, if you're kind of new to the church. We would like to get to know you. One way we could do that is there's a connect form that you can tear off in the bulletin. If you didn't receive a bulletin, we probably have extras. The ushers could get you one or you could grab one on the way out. There's information in this bulletin you might want to know about. Also, all the announcements I'm going to say are at crossview.church slash Sunday. You also might be interested in our app. It's really great. Somebody's keeping up with this app and putting all our information on it. Uh, you can download the app and stay up to date on things happening at Crossview. So, and also I should say welcome to those who are with us in spirit, watching online, worshiping. All right, well, we have, we like to highlight a local ministry partner every month. The month of January, our mission partner is Options for Women. And if you aren't familiar with that organization, stay tuned. We're going to tell you a lot more about it. But it is an amazing organization here in town that helps women who have found themselves pregnant. There are fatherhood classes. There is pregnancy help. All sorts of amazing services that Options for Women offers to families. So we'll tell you more how we're going to partner with them in the month of January. Another thing I want to tell you is we're having a baby blessings class. Any child who is baptized or dedicated here at the church has gone through a class. I will be teaching this class on the 21st. You don't need to RSVP. You can just come. If you have a baby or child that hasn't been baptized or dedicated and you're feeling like now is the time, please come to that class. It's less than an hour. You'll get to meet some other families that might be in your same age and stage. So that is for children and their parents. All right, another thing coming up on the 28th of January is a newcomer meet and greet. This is for you if you've been around Crossview from roughly 6 to 12 months. You know, if you're newish and it's under a year that you've been around this church, we would love to get to know you. We're going to serve you lunch Child care is provided. The pastors and staff will be there to answer any questions you have, and we're going to get to know each other better. We do want you to RSVP, RSVP for that one because we want to know how much food to buy for lunch. So please join us if you're newish to the church, okay? Um, we pushed year-end giving quite a bit this past month, didn't we, in December? We talked about how important how important it is to give at the end of the year. And we asked you to be generous. And we had a goal of $150,000. And God surpassed the goal. You all gave so generously. We, we gathered $200,000. You, church, you did that. God did that. You surpassed the goal. And there was a lot of prayer, I don't want to say worry, but there was a lot of prayer that went into that, of that year end, like, are we going to meet this goal? And God did it through you. God surpassed it. And the kids surpassed their goal as well. They were raising money down the children's wing. And so now they get to do the slime and the pie in the face and the egg. They get to do it all because they raised all the money for the kids' wing. So uh, thank you to parents for that as well for supporting the Next Gen ministry. So next week, you uh, will want to see pastors or staff getting slimed or pied or something. Past Pastor Brad was like, I have to preach right after. What am I going to do if he ends up getting slimed? But we'll find out. It's a sacrifice for the kingdom of God. You need to do it. Um, but really, we cannot say thank you enough for your partnership, for the gospel, People need to know about Jesus. People need Jesus. And this church is one way that God is doing that, right? We get to be part of a body of Christ that is sharing the love of Jesus here, near, and far. So thank you for that partnership. I just got back from the Mexico mission trip, and I can't wait to tell you more about it. Next Sunday, we'll have some slides. We'll have a few stories about the Mexico mission trip. That also happened because you gave. And I just want to tell you, sneak peek, but like God took our little loaves and fishes and multiplied it. It was so humbling to be there in Mexico with fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. So we'll tell you more about that. But I invite our ushers to come forward. We're going to receive this morning's offering. Please allow me to pray over it. God, you 
surprise us. You bless us. You overwhelm us. You sustain us. You provide for us. We are so grateful. God, thank you for the generosity of the people in this church that you work through them. So God, we thank you. You are the source of all good things. So we give to you today what we can, and we ask you to multiply it as only you can. And all of God's children said together, amen. has walked beside me The winter storms made way for spring In every season from where I'm standing I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life all over is in fulfillment all over my life all over my life help me remember when I'm weak fear may come but fear will leave you led my heart And you always will be. I see the evidence of your goodness all over my life, all over my life. I see your promises in fulfillment all over my life, all If you have a Bible, we're going to be in the book of John. Before we jump into that, every year in January, the first week, we do a little something different in the service. We do what we call a spiritual pathway self-review. And so when we use the word pathways, what that means at Crossview is um, it goes back to the book of Acts. And it's the way that the early church followed Christ, is that they worshiped together. 
they were in community, they served. It says in Acts 4 that no one was in need. That's how they served each other. It was so profound. And then they were generous with what they had. And so we do a little review around those. And this is for you to say, how am I doing spiritually? What is God doing in my life? And so if you want to right now, literally we're going to take about two or three minutes, take out your phone and scan that code up there. And we're going to take two or three minutes with music going on to do that. If you don't have a device, we have some paper copies, but I want to ask you, please use your device if you have it. That way we don't have to go on and fill in stuff. Uh, so the paper forms, if you don't have a device, device, raise your hand. And our ushers will hand those out to you. So if you don't have a device, you need a paper version, just raise your hand up and somebody will run to you. Um, but yeah, take a couple of minutes. It's really self-explanatory and uh, go ahead and fill, fill this out. So if we can just play some music while we're doing that. About another minute and for those of you playing Tetris that's okay as well So I see a number of you still looking down. Please finish it um, while I'm talking, or you can finish it after the service, whatever you want to do. Um, again, 
A lot of you were looking down, which is really encouraging, unless, again, you were playing cribbage or whatever it is you were doing. Um, we're in and out of a series in the Gospel of John this year. We're going chapter by chapter. Uh, next week, we're going to start a three-week break. Uh, if you have been around Crossview on uh, Martin Luther King weekend every year since I've been here, uh, we talk about race. And so we're going to do a three-week series called Polarized, where we look at society, we look at the church, we look at politics, and everything seems polarized today. And we're going to say, what does the gospel speak into that? What does it mean to be a follower of Christ as we look at a very polarized society? But John 11, I think there's a question that sits out of John 11, especially if you only go down through verse 37. And the question that it sort of asks of us is simply this. It'll be on the screen. How do you believe when you're disappointed in God? The theme of the gospel of John is belief. And chapter 20 says, I've written these things that you might believe that Jesus is the Son of God and that by believing you might have life in his name. And so how do you believe when you feel like God has disappointed you? And this has been a question that has been in my mind for decades. About 18 months into my pastoral journey, on a Saturday morning in January, I remember getting a call from the senior pastor, Dr. Auckland, and got on the phone and his words were, Dan Hinkle has committed suicide. And Dan, you've heard, some of you have heard the story, Dan was like the core kid in the youth group, had invited tons and tons of kids from the local high school, strong faith, and committed suicide was just like the world dropped. And what that started for me was a journey with this question, the question of what do you do with faith when you feel disappointed in God? And then you go to deeper places that we'll talk about this morning, and how does that connect to the problem of evil in our world? Evil and pain and sin and death and brokenness, how does it speak into that? And I think if I ask the question, have you ever felt disappointed in God, everyone in this room would have to say yes. There's been a moment in your life, there's been maybe many moments in some of your life where you feel disappointed in God. We have blamed God for something, a job loss, a diagnosis, a relationship that fell apart, but we've gotten to the point in it where we've been so hurt that we've blamed God. And that asks the next phase of questions, which is this, is it wrong to be disappointed in God? And what I want you to hear me up front, and we'll say it again, is it's not wrong to be disappointed in God. As part of the human journey with God, there will be a time, if you haven't felt it yet, where you will be disappointed in God. If you look at the Psalms, so many of the Psalms are about the psalmist journey of feeling disappointed in God, frustrated with how the world is lining up and saying at the end, but somehow still I trust you. One of my favorite is Psalm 73. The, the worship leader in the temple, Asaph, writes this psalm, and on the front side of it, he says, God, I'm so disappointed in you. What he, what he was disappointed is he was looking out at the world and he's saying, the bad people get ahead the best. Like the evil, wicked people seem to be ruling the day. And he's pointing the finger at God. He said, I'm so disappointed in you, God, my feet almost slipped. And in sort of poetry terms, what's that mean? what that means is I almost gave up on my faith. I don't get it. I don't understand it. It's, I would encourage you to read this interesting psalm. But so many of the psalms are that journey. The psalmist names their frustration with God. God, you've disappointed me in this way. Then they go into the act of remembering God's faithfulness, like that song that we heard earlier. And at the end, it's like, I can still trust, I think. I can still believe in God. And John 11 is such a beautiful chapter. We've got to jump back a little bit before. If you look at the last couple chapters where we've been, the religious leaders are growing increasingly upset at what Jesus is doing. He's healing. He's breaking the Sabbath. They're also growing increasingly upset at what he's saying. In the last couple of chapters, we've seen Jesus is saying, I am Israel's true king. But the king looks different than what you think. In chapter 10, the king is a good shepherd who's willing to die for the sheep. And anything that calls itself the kingdom of God that doesn't have a king who's willing to die for the sheep, that's the posture of humility, is not the kingdom of God. And so we come to John 11, which is such an interesting chapter. The first 16 verses tell us the story of Lazarus being sick. And word is sent to Jesus that Lazarus is sick. Lazarus and Mary and Martha, his sisters, are good friends of Jesus. We don't know exactly how, but they're good friends. And so the sisters send word of like, Jesus, please come and help. We think you can help. We know you've healed people. And Jesus responds in a little bit of a cryptic way like he does. And he takes an extra two days where he's at it, almost as though he doesn't care on some 
level. It's sort of weird. And then you get to verse 17. So here's, we're going to be in verse 17. Let me pray before we jump in. God, I pray that you'd use your word to encourage us this morning. I think this is such an important question on our, all of our journey of faith. Of how do we believe when we feel like you've disappointed us? So verse 17 says this. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in their loss of their brother. And this is, it would be normal. If you were a pious Jew in the first century, and this was someone that you knew, you would go and mourn with them. Mourning happened together in community. So verse 20 says, when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him. But Mary stayed home. And if you've ever heard John 11 preach, it's often around Martha and Mary. So let me give you a little context. In the first century, Judaism, they took grieving seriously. The first week of deep grief was spent mourning at one's home. You would sit on the floor. You would be visited by friends. They called this Shiva for seven days. It's still practiced today for strong for people who are strong Jews. And it would help the mourners sort of release their grief in the context of community. Then it says that mourners would actually, for the next three weeks, that they would abstain from adornment. And what that means is getting all prettied up. Like their clothing and their posture would reflect what they're feeling. And then for the next year, they would refrain from common pleasures. Because death was significant. And they wanted to name it. They wanted to be in this in community. And so Mary staying home and Martha going is not really the point of the text. And I've heard this preached from both ways, that Mary's the hero because she stayed home and she did what was faithful, or Martha sort of got up from the Shiva and she wasn't supposed to leave. You had to stay home. She goes out to meet Jesus. I think the point really should be they're both grieving in their own way. This is a really, really big deal. They've lost their brother before he should have died. Verse 21 says this. Lord Martha said, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. She's wrestling with this, like the tension of, if you had done what I had asked you, God, we'd be okay. But yet she's still clinging to belief, right? I still think that you are God and you can do something. So Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Mary answered, Mary, uh, Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. We talked about one, a common belief in the first century for a faithful Jew is they believed at the end that all those faithful would be raised from the dead. They believed in this thing called a resurrection, that life would actually win at the end of the day. And Jesus said to her, so important, this is the fifth of the, I, of the seven I am statements in John. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die Whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? I am the resurrection and the life. So important. This is the thing that we want to believe, that she did believe. She says, I believe in it. And Jesus says, I am it. I am life right now. By following me, you can begin to glimpse feelings, understanding what that resurrection life truly will be. We'll break this down a little bit more at the end. And she says, he said, do you believe this? She says, verse 27, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. And isn't it interesting? He said, do you believe I'm the resurrection and the life? She doesn't say, I believe that. She says, I believe you're the Messiah. And the Messiah was the deliverer, the one who was going to come and rescue Israel. She says, I believe that. I'm not sure about this resurrection thing that you say that you are, that I believe will happen at the end of time. Verse 28. After she said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews had been with Mary in the house comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her. So now they've both broken Shiva, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would have not died. This is interesting. Both sisters, the moment they meet Jesus, express their disappointment. And Jesus doesn't get mad. He doesn't reprimand them. He's a little cryptic with I am the resurrection of life, but he doesn't get mad at them. 
He lets them voice what their disappointment is. If you had been here, maybe he would not have died. They, they probably don't fully get what's going to happen down the road when Jesus saw her weeping. Weeping. And the Jews who had come along with her also, also weeping. He was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? He asked. Come and see. Lord, they replied. And then verse 35, Jesus wept. The shortest verse in all of Scripture. Jesus wept. It's a beautiful thing. We'll break that down a little bit more at the end. Then the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? And I'm going to stop the story in verse 37. As our pastoral team was studying it, we're like, what if the, what if the story stopped at verse 37? For those of you that have read John 11, Lazarus gets raised from the dead. And in the very act of Jesus raising Lazarus from the dead, the religious leaders go crazy. And this is the road to the cross now. And raising Lazarus from the dead, he's nailed his coffin or stone over the tomb. But what if it stopped at verse 37? What would we think? How would we ask the questions of how do you believe when you're disappointed in God? When Mary and Martha asked Jesus to come and he didn't come. When he didn't do the simple thing that they had asked. How do you and I wrestle with our faith when we're feeling disappointed in God? And I think there's a beautiful thing in John 11, in this story. If we end it at verse 37, I think there's two words that we can take and just wrestle with. One is truth and the other is tears. I think Jesus gives Mary and Martha and all of us when we're wrestling with disappointment, truth and tears. The truth is this. It's exactly what Jesus said. I am the resurrection and the life. Why is that important? Because in that day and in our day, the world around us is filled with death and pain and brokenness and relations that are, relationships that are messed up. Things aren't right. And so we need to hear I and the resurrection and the life. There's something more than that. And I think it solicits sort of this question of trying to understand how do we wrestle with we're disappointed because in our disappointment we're naming that the world's not right. We're naming that evil is out there. If you look at Scripture, Scripture exalts God, lifts God up as creator over all. That God is sovereign over all. That he's omnipotent. He's able to do whatever God God wants to do. God controls all. God does what God decides, right? That's who God is. Romans eleven thirty six 36 puts it this way. All things are from him and through him and to him. God is sovereign over all. We believe that. I believe that with all my heart. Yet, Scripture is clear that God does not choose to meticulously control everything. He wants people to love him by what? Choice, not manipulation. God wants our love to come from us. Deuteronomy 30, verses 15 through 19 says this, I have set before you today life and prosperity, death and adversity. If you obey, in other words, if you choose to obey the commandments of the Lord your God, then you will live. And the Lord your God will bless you, but if your hearts turn away and you do not hear, I declare to you today that you will perish. I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Choose life so that you and your descendants may live. Scripture is full of instances and stories where people are invited to make choices. With God, with each other, from good, from evil, it's constant. And so the reality is God is fully in control when we think about being disappointed in God, but we also have free will. And in the sort of theological world, some people love to be all the way over here and God's in control, controlling everything. Like the world is just sort of a chess set. And others like to be over here on completely on free will. And what I would say, it's somewhere in the middle. It's more tension than I think we, we choose to believe, that God's in control but doesn't choose to act on everything we ask or acts in a different way. It's the parent who gives the child an answer they don't like but still knows is the answer that's right. So let me give you a couple of thoughts about this. If we really think about a Christian response, and we think about the idea of the truth of Jesus being the resurrection and the life. One is this. Scripture does not give us a nice, tidy solution to the problem of evil. 
Jesus' resurrection and life because evil exists. And it doesn't give us an easy answer. I remember being at a talk about evil, the existence of evil in God, by a professor from Princeton Seminary, George Hunsinger, a number of years ago. And he made some statements that I still go back to again and again and again. He said, the Christian story connected to the problem of evil provides not an argument, but a name, a person. Not a system, but a narrative, the story of God. Not a principle, but a person. Not an idea, but an event, the incarnation, the cross, and the resurrection. Those are the answer to evil. You've been at a funeral that I've done. I say this every funeral. Jürgen Moltmann, German theologian, said, God suffers with us so that we may one day laugh with him. Like in your disappointment, God sits right next to you and says, I'm here with you. And there may not be an easy answer. Scripture also points to us as image bearers. That we as followers of Christ are meant to image back to God and to each other who God is. Servant who's willing to die for one another. And then scripture, at its core, has this creation narrative. It's how things were. They were whole and right and good right at the beginning of scripture. How things are, and how things are, it's good and evil. It's beauty and brokenness. We know it's not fully right. The very line of evil that we see out there sits in all of us. But then, most importantly, it's how things will be. Revelation 21, that one day there will be no more death, tears, crying, or pain. And so in our disappointment, what I want to encourage you, and I've heard this as I've sat with people before, whatever that thing that is causing your disappointment, whatever that pain is, it's not from God. Can God use it? Yes. Can God be with you in it? Yes. But anything that is not of Revelation 21, tears, death, no more tears, death, crying, or pain, is not from God. God didn't hand it to you. God is with you. I think God can give you the strength, but it's not from God. I can't say that more clearly. And for some of you, this is a huge question. This is, this is probably the number one question that I wrestle with, with people as a pastor. And if you want to take it to a deeper level, I want to give you a couple of resources that have been hugely formative in my life. It'll be a couple of books on the, on the screen here. One is, Is God to Blame by Greg Boyd. A fabulous, fabulous book if you're really wrestling with this question. Another one is Heaven by Randy Alcorn. And you can buy the book or you can buy a little, there's a little, oh, probably 30-page little thing deal. Actually, I actually have a bunch in my office. If you want one, just come and talk to me. Uh, I was talking to Sarah about this book before, The Problem of Pain by C.S. Lewis. If you've not read any C.S. Lewis, this is a fabulous book to start with. And then Psalms by the Bible. Uh, I was hoping that would solicit a, a chuckle or two. The Psalms are a great place to go because it's a bunch of people who wrestled with being disappointed in God. So truth, and it's hard. This is, this is a conversation we could have for hours. It's been a lifelong journey for me, but it's, it's important. Jesus says, I am the resurrection and the life, and it means we wrestle with evil and injustice and the pain in the world around us. But Jesus also in our story gives tears. Jesus wept, right? If you've never memorized a verse in scripture, there you go. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. And that word for weep is a loud expression of grief. Think ugly cry. Like Jesus sobbed with Mary and Martha. Probably got down on the ground with them and was there with them in their pain. And he knew what was going to happen. Isn't that interesting? Like Jesus knew he was going to raise Lazarus from the dead at a funeral a few weeks ago of a 36-year-old. And I remember they carried the, uh, the urn out to the, the car at the end. And the wife, the four kids went out there. And I heard a welling and crying that I had never heard before. She had lost her 36-year-old husband. And I think that's probably what Jesus is doing with them. I stood off to the side and watched it. Jesus walked into it and was, was with them in it. Like, wept loudly with them. And why? You wonder, why does he do that? Because he knows what's going to happen. Because I think Jesus wept because he experienced and understood the same feelings as the people around him. Jesus is fully human. And this is one of the most profoundly human moments we have of Jesus, that he is there when you're disappointed God is there with you. So how do you believe when you're disappointed in God? There's no easy answer. 
I think there's truth, I think there's tears. But I think this is one of those questions that is the ongoing journey of life. And it brings me back to what I said at the beginning around the Psalms. I think the Psalms remind us of what it means to be human in our relationship with God. And so when you're disappointed, there's a rhythm in the Psalms that I think is really beautiful. First of all, name your disappointment. God's big enough. Whatever your disappointment is, talk to God about it. Tell him you're disappointed in him. But then if you look at most of the Psalms where there's this lament going on, there's pain going on, the next phase of the Psalm is to remember who God truly is. So lament, name it, yell at God, do what you have to do. But then sit with God's faithfulness. Like where are the places God has been faithful in your life? Where, is the, where are the places God has been faithful in, in maybe your family history, your church history? It's a name that there is a faithful God even in the midst of being disappointed. And then at the end of these psalms, there's this really interesting thing that happens that, that I don't fully get. I know I've done it before, but I don't fully get. So there's lament. There's God, I'm disappointed in you. I'm frustrated with you. I'm mad at you. But yet I know there are these places where you've been really faithful. And then at the end, it'll often end like this. But God, I trust in you. Just a simple line. So in the midst of my disappointment, in the midst of my pain, in the midst of me just wanting to put my fist in the air, I choose to trust. And I think that's the journey. I really do in that simplicity. I think that's the answer of the journey of feeling disappointed, which I promise if you don't feel right now, you will. But God wants to be with you in it. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I have actually loved this story. And we know Lazarus gets raised from the dead, but Lord, I think for so many of us, our story is not there right now. Our story is in the pain, our story is in the frustration, our story is in the disappointment, Lord. So I pray over anyone in this room, God, who just needs to know that you're there weeping with them, that they would know and sense your presence in profound ways. Lord, that you would use the community of faith around them, Lord, to weep with Praise the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We come to this table of communion every single week because it is a source of encouragement. It's a way for us to remember what Jesus has done for us. Today we're going to do something extra special that we like to do at the beginning of January as we start this new year. We're going to receive communion and also affirm our baptism. This is an affirmation of Baptism Sunday as well. When you come forward for communion, you will be able to be anointed with oil. There are um, little glasses with oil in them, so you'll receive the bread receive the cup, and receive a blessing. That is optional. If you don't want to have your head anointed with oil, you don't need to. But it is a way for us to say, the work that God began in us, God is going to bring it to fruition, right? God is going to bring it to completion. God is at work with us, and we are remembering our baptism. We are saying that we, that the Holy Spirit is in us and we recognize that we belong to him. So you will be able to experience that anointing with oil and affirmation of your baptism this morning as well. When we come to this table of communion, we come not because we must, but because we may. We need Jesus. I need Jesus. Speaking for myself, I desperately need Jesus in my life. And so I want to receive the body and blood of Christ this morning. We come not because we are strong, but because we are weak. We come not because we have a claim on the grace of God, but because in our frailty and sin, we stand in constant need of God. So we remember that Jesus, with his friends, the night before he would be betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it, and he said to the disciples, this is my body, which was broken for you. Take and eat it in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus took the cup, and after giving thanks, said, 
This is my blood poured out for you. This is the new covenant, the new promise in my blood. with my blood. I am showing you this. Take and drink in remembrance of me. So this morning we eat and we drink in remembrance of Jesus. I invite the usher, not the ushers, the servers to come forward. And I would love to pray for us as we prepare our hearts for communion. Jesus, we do recognize the sacrifice you made for us. We recognize your humanity, like in today's story in John 11, that you wept, that you loved Lazarus with your whole heart. Jesus, you walked among us and experienced many of the same things that we experience. So we thank you for that. We thank you that you chose to go to the cross on our behalf for the forgiveness of our sins. And we need that. We confess that we have sinned. Would you forgive us? And this morning, we affirm our baptism. We reaffirm our baptism. We say, yes, we belong to you, Jesus. So I pray, Lord, as we come for communion and the anointing of oil and the writing on these prayer boards... God, would you fill us? Would you renew our faith? Would you strengthen us? We need you. And I pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Come, friends, for the feast is ready.
Would you please stand for the benediction? As we head out um, to the left, there is a Bible with four, uh, or there's a Bible with tables on it. There's a table with four Bibles on it. And they're all gone. Then nobody can take the Bibles. Uh, somebody, it was really cool. Somebody came up and said, hey, I've been reading this chronological Bible and I'd like to buy 50 for the church. So a pretty good chunk of change. And last week, one of the things we talked about was like what it would look like as a community if we read our Bibles daily, whether it's an app or an actual Bible. And last week, all but four were taken, and apparently today, the last four were taken. So no more free Bibles. Uh, but the YouVersion app, this is, this is, if you have not downloaded the YouVersion app, so many devotionals on that, different ways to read the Bible, I'd really encourage you to do that. And if you need prayer, Mark and Sarah over here under the cross, they would love to pray over. If you want to talk about faith, whatever it might be, they would love to pray over. Would you please join me in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace. Oh